After the famous but failed Washington Moscow reset, it appears now the administration is preparing to embrace a very different, though historically familiar, policy towards Russia. It's called containment. It worked during the Cold War against the Soviet Union. Will it work against today's Russia? And does this mean Washington has declared a new Cold War? To Crosstalk Washington's spinning of containment, I'm joined by my guest Stephen Cohen in New York. He is a professor emeritus of Russian studies and politics at New York University and Princeton University and author of the recent book, Soviet Fates in Lost Alternatives. And in Chicago, we cross to John Mearsheimer. He is a professor in the political science department at the University of Chicago who has written extensively on international security. His latest book is The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. And I ask you a very broad-ended question here. Uh, what are future historians going to think about this time period right now? Well, if there are any future historians left, because this could easily lead to nuclear war, but we could go to that later, I think that they will ask the same questions they asked about the uh, previous Cold War, the 45-year Cold War. Uh, who was responsible for it? Which policies? Which factors? Which leaders? How do you divide the responsibility back then in the 40s between the United States and the Soviet Union? But a critical question, Peter, and I think Professor Mersheimer may agree, is that when did it begin? Because you don't know when to begin your analysis. And what we have at the moment, for example, and future historians will sort this out, but I've pretty much made up my mind. Did this new Cold War, which, as you pointed out, according to the New York Times, uh, the White House has resolved on, uh, did this Cold War begin with the Ukrainian crisis? Did it begin, for example, in November uh, 2013, when Ukraine, the president then, Yanukovych, rejected Europe's offer for a partnership, e economic partnership? Did it begin in February this year, uh, a couple months ago, when Yanukovych fell and a government supported by the street became the government of uh, Kiev? Or did it begin when Russia was uh, annexed or reunited with Russia, depending on how you look at it. Now, the reason this is important is that the alternative historical perspective is to argue that it began right after the end of the Soviet Union okay, in the right. 1990s, right. when the Clinton administration right. began to expand NATO. So you're going to, historians will debate this question. When did it begin? And then the analysis will begin. John, in, in Chicago, uh, well, this is a very good point that Stephen brings up, because we have South Ossetia in 2008 as well. But maybe it's the dysfunctionality of the entire um, uh, post-Cold War environment. I mean, what, has the international system found any kind of ba balance? Or are we still moving? Moving to some kind of uh, lack of equilibrium, or is it the United States just has gotten used to being very hegemon hegemonic? Well, I basically agree with Steve, which is that I think that uh, the United States and the West more generally, but especially the United States, has found it almost impossible to put Cold War thinking uh, behind it. And as a result, in the mid-1990s, the Clinton administration began to push hard for NATO expansion. And there's no way you could explain NATO expansion unless you make the argument that it's designed to contain some sort of future Russian threat. Nobody put the argument for NATO expansion in those terms at the time. But in retrospect, it's quite clear that that's what was going on. So the deep cause of the present crisis, I believe, is NATO expansion, which is part and parcel of a strategy designed to contain Russia and to strip Ukraine away from Russia's orbit and integrate it into the West. The precipitating crisis, what caused the uh, present uh, crisis that's going on, I should say the precipitating cause of the present crisis, uh, were the events of February of this year, especially the February 22 coup yeah. uh, in Kiev. It's, Stephen, it's interesting if we if we look at NATO expansion, I mean, it ends up being kind of like a chicken and the egg uh, situation because um, if Russia is the threat, do you want to expand NATO? But um, if it isn't a threat, you know, or if you expand it, you do create a Russia that is extremely anxious about a, a vast military complex moving towards its border. I mean, it, you know, it, what do what should the world expect from a country like Russia that has has had a history of being a major power, still is an important power in the world? 
and all of a sudden it has this military apparatus right at its very border, and we, and we have this Ukraine crisis where uh, John pointed out there it, 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 with the coup in Kiev, which was illegal. In my mind, that is a red line. The, the, the Kremlin said, look, we can't trust these people. These people lie. They openly lie now. You see, the problem here, Peter, is, and I'm going to retreat into my vocation as a historian, is that John is absolutely right. This began uh, the push that's now come to shove in the 1990s. A historian will say to you, wait a minute, I know this doesn't go down well today, but we need the archives. We need to see what the Clinton administration and its European allies were thinking. Did they ask themselves the question you just asked, Peter? If we start moving NATO toward Russia, and you're right, I mean, there was no reason other than to contain Russia. By the way, if that's so, then the answer to my question, when did the policy of containment, new containment, which the New York Times said last Sunday, or on, I think it was April 20th, that the uh, uh, Obama administration has now adopted, when did that begin? Then the new policy of containment began in the 1990s. But we need to know, what did the Clinton administration think would be Russia's reaction? That's exactly the question you asked me. Now, logically, logically, you and I and Professor Mersheimer would agree that if you push and push militarily uh, toward a great power, perhaps not so great at that time, but coming back, that had once been your adversary, it's going to reawaken all sorts of old conflictual thinking. Uh, idea, ideological reflexes. It's going to do that. Do you want to do that? But can we assume that the Clinton administration or politi any political leadership is so rational? If we do, then they made a grievous mistake. Mm -hmm. They understood what could happen and they did it anyway. If they didn't know, they should not have been in power because they were misinformed. John, I, I think you know, one of the interesting things I've, I've well, talked about. Talk, go I ahead, just, jump in. Go, please jump, do. Can please I just, do. Yeah, I just want to jump in. Uh, I think that two things are going on here. I think, first of all, the Clinton administration, and this was true of the George W. Bush administration as well, viewed the United States as a benign hegemon. And we think that we are different than other great powers, and that when we expand our influence, countries like Russia will understand that we're ultimately not very threatening, because we are the good guys in the international system. This is a remarkably foolish way of thinking yeah. about the world. But I believe if you spend any time in Washington, it becomes clear that yeah. this delusion is widespread. Second point I would make is that we and were Peter, able to Peter, get away Peter, with Peter, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, go ahead. John, finish your second point, and we'll go to, I'll go back to Stephen. Go ahead. Second point I would make is we were able to get away with NATO expansion uh, in the early uh, 2000s and in the 1990s because Russia was remarkably weak. And because the initial waves of NATO expansion were not so close to Russia's border. What's happened now is that Russia has recovered uh, from the 1990s. It's much more powerful today than it was back then. And furthermore, expanding NATO to Ukraine is putting NATO right on Russia's border and creating a direct threat. So it's those changes that make the present situation much more volatile than what happened in the 90s and in the early 2000s. Stephen in New York, you wanted to jump in there. Please do. Yeah, I apologize to John no for interrupting. It's, uh, he being in Chicago and I no being problem. in New York creates the problem. <laughs> uh, I think John's thesis is exceedingly important, and it's more than a thesis. And he being perhaps the preeminent American scholar of international affairs and American behavior ab abroad, we have to take it seriously. The view that American policymakers think that we behave abroad, no matter how aggressively, only benignly, and that other people will see it this way, is reflected in what's happening today. It's astonishing to me mm. that unlike in previous run-ups to war, Cold War or hot, there is no opposition in the American Congress. Yeah. There is no opposition in the mainstream American media to the United States policy toward Russia today, only blaming of Russia. Now, the only way you can explain that is a kind of inherent knee-jerk assumption by the 500-plus members, elected members of Congress, that what we're doing must be benign, and therefore what Russia's doing must be nothing but, quote, as they put it, naked aggression, even though empirically it's plainly not the truth. 
but there is no opposition. There is no criticism in the mainstream media that would slow this process. And the explanation, I guess, is what Professor Mersheimer has just set out. Uh, Stephen, it's very interesting is that during the Cold War, there was a debate about the nature of American foreign policy uh, in, in its relationship to the Soviet Union. But t after the Cold War, there is no debate, as you just said there. That's quite interesting, isn't it? It's more than interesting for me because it's autobiographical. I'm probably the oldest, oldest person on this broadcast today. I participated in the debates of the light, late 1970s and early 80s. They were called the debate between the detentist, those of us who wanted to reduce the Cold War, and the Cold Warriors who wanted to step up the Cold War with the Soviet Union. But there was a real debate. We, the detentist, were always in a minority always in a minority, but we were present on the op-ed pages of the main American newspapers. Was, this was before cable TV, but we were on television, we were on radio, we got our say. We even had a, I don't know if this is the right word, but a lobby group uh, called the American Committee for East-West Accord, I remember which it. included CEOs of powerful organizations, Donald Kennell, Tom Watson of IBM. Administration is selling because it looks like it's given up on dialogue, it's given up on diplomacy, it's given up on problem solving. Uh, you know, in Ukraine, there were opportunities to avert what's going on there now, but they were missed opportunities because the United States didn't want to respect anyone else as an equal partner. Well, I think what's going on here is that the United States has a particular world view. As we were saying before, if you go inside the Beltway uh, in Washington, you go inside the foreign policy establishment, what you see is there's remarkable consensus mm -hmm. uh, among Republicans and Democrats about the nature of American foreign policy and about the nature of the world around us. Most Americans in the foreign policy establishment believe uh, that the United States is the indispensable nation. They believe that we stand taller, that we see further, that we are a benign hegemon, and that we not only have a right, but we have a responsibility to run the world, and that most states out there should understand that. And people are baffled that the Russians don't understand that our motives are good and that what we're doing in Eastern Europe uh, is all designed to create peace and stability. Of course, for other countries around the world, uh, this is not the way they see things. And it's not only true of the Russians, it's true of the Chinese as well. All you have to do is follow President Obama's uh, travels through Asia, which are taking place uh, right now to understand uh, just how complicated this situation is in Asia with regard to Chinese-American relations. Mm. So we have problems all over the world because other people don't uh, see things the way we do. You know, that's, Stephen, you, this is exactly where I wanted to go. Um, it's, it's very interesting to me is that uh, the U.S. government and its allies it just cannot conceive of uh, another party's perspective. Uh, Russia's perspective and what's going on in the world is never given any airtime in the mainstream media at all. I mean, it, people, I've been, we on Crosstalk have been doing um, uh, Ukraine-related um, topics for months now, and we come across people that are just baffled. They've never heard of Victoria Newland. They've never heard about snipers in Kiev. They've never heard uh, about Yulia Tumashenko saying uh, that the Russians should be killed. They've never heard these things. And these people are not stupid. We wouldn't bring them on the program. But they've never heard these things or they thought they were just very minor things. My point is, they, you know, the U.S. and its allies can't see how other people see the world. You're asking a question uh, that I often ask myself and it's beyond my competence to answer. I would say this, again, evoking my age, I remember the time when there were so-called wise men and women mm. who urged a president of the United States and a Congress to see both sides of any story, even if it involved the Soviet Union. There's an old American adage, there are two sides to every story. And to understand the other side, you have to walk in the other person's shoes a bit, try as an intellectual exercise. That's an obligation, in my judgment, for policymakers who may control the fate of the world. We don't seem to have that cadre of elder statesmen. Uh, I think Henry Kissinger is one such person. But you, he, not, he's 90 years old, but his mind works very well. But you don't see him popping up on television. You don't see him. He, he published an op-ed article in the Washington Post back in March, but he came and went, and that was it. But there used to be quite a few people like that who would say to the president, yes, probably Moscow is guilty, but let's take a look at this. Let's see how we are perceived 
as John would put it, around the world. How you explain that, I don't know that those people are gone. But meanwhile, because they're gone, uh, the, the, the American mainstream uh, media seems to instinctively filter out dissenting voices. Mm -hmm. John and I uh, appeared briefly, fleetingly, like heretics living in exile someplace. <laughs> In the mainstream, media. I know the feeling. And, Don't and worry, I, I know I, the feeling. <laughs> I haven't seen. I haven't, I haven't seen John since, and, and I don't think he's seen me either. I mean, there's a process of kind of rejection, and here's the thing, Peter, because we really are, and I think we should get to this, moving to an exceedingly dangerous moment. Uh, I have a very bleak view of what could happen, mm -hmm. but there is this pattern that as the drumbeat of war in America build, builds, whether it's Cold War or Hot War, dissenting voices, though they might have been there in the beginning, slowly are either overwhelmed by the war boosters or they're deleted yeah. by the kind of institutional reflexes of Washington. And that's where we are today as things really, really are moving fast toward the unimaginable, which I would say is war between the United States and Russia. Oh, that's unthinkable. But, John, John, let me, if, let's talk about he, contain, okay, uh, this is crosstalk, please jump in. Go ahead. I was just going to make two points. One is that I was one of the most outspoken opponents of the Iraq war. And uh, it was very lonely. Yeah. And it was very clear that anybody who opposed that war uh, came under attack from all sides for being unpatriotic, for being an appeaser, for being a fool, for being a left winger, and so forth and so on. And we did not have a healthy debate in the United States about going into Iraq as a result uh, of the fact that there was such a consensus in the elite and people were afraid to speak out against a war that was really remarkably foolish. So in a funny way, the situation with Ukraine is not that different. Now, I think what's going on here, just to talk a bit about this, is that when the Cold War ended, what happened is that the United States emerged in a situation where it had no rival uh, that had the military power to check it and to make it think seriously about how to conduct foreign policy. The fact is we are so remarkably powerful that we can do all sorts of foolish things <laughs> and we don't pay that significant a price, or at least we haven't up to now, because we are a remarkably secure country. At the same time, when the Cold War ended, uh, Frank Fukuyama wrote this very famous article called The End of History that basically said that history was on our side. We had defeated fascism in the first half of the 20th century and communism in the second half of the 20th century, and the wind was at our back. Everybody was going to end up looking like us. So we felt incredibly uh, good about ourselves, and we thought that we could go out in the world and reshape the world in our own image because we, again, had the wind at our back. And when you couple that basic worldview with the fact that we did emerge as a remarkably powerful country, full of self-confidence, it's hardly surprised that we have been marching all over the globe for the past 25 years uh, trying to slay all sorts of dragons and thinking at the same time that we are a benign hegemon, which of course we're not. And as a result, we have done a pretty terrible job of running foreign policy. And the latest manifestation of it is this crisis in Ukraine. We've ever had uh, many thanks to my guests in New York and in Chicago. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. And remember, Crosstalk Rules. I'm C, I'm C. 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 I'm C.